We're now going to discuss the sign of Taurus, how a Messiah is a servant, the way an ox plows with his master, the way a donkey bears burdens for his master. This will represent how he labored for us and how we labor for him. And he says, Matthew 11:28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Why? For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's not the same yoke that you see with your eyes on the earth. We follow as we believe as those that trust in him, those that believe in him, those that serve him, are like oxen with a different kind of a yoke. And it's not hard. It's a labor of love. But it is indeed a labor. We are doing things for our master as he did things to show as an example for his master, who he called his father in heaven. He was showing us an example of how to do things. Now, what kind of yoke did he have? He had the same kind we have. A yoke of, of love for thy neighbor and a love for your father in heaven. That's our yoke. That's what binds us to the master. That's that royal law that's within us. When we see the problem at the, at the wayside where the thieves broke upon him and hurt him and cut him, and he's dying, that good Samaritan, it wasn't the Levite, it wasn't the priest, keeper of the temple, it was the Samaritan who wasn't even acknowledged as somebody that knows the truth or worships correctly. Basically, he saw himself there. And that good Samaritan has the example of this yoke. Bear ye one another's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. We each have to bear our own burdens, and we also have to bear others' burdens. And the whole thing is easy, and the whole thing is rest, and there's eternal rest. We have this eye on the reward. We have a carrot in front of us, and we have the blinders where all we see is the carrot. And we're like this dumb horse that is just pulling that wagon. Because he's going after that carrot. That's all he sees. He just keeps going for it. There's not only Taurus. There's Orion. And there's Origa. And there is Iridanus. Those names all have meanings as well. Where they, they reinforce this um, idea that there is a plowing going on. The next sign, uh, Orion. The one who is driving the oxen. And Origa... Uh, the, a close Hebrew word that's used in the Bible that sounds like its meaning is um, a furrow. It's a, it's a raised garden bed, okay? It's where things grow, and it makes sense to be in the sign because oxen is plowing, making this raised garden bed. It doesn't make sense to have a shepherd in, in, this, in this group which uh, Origa is as sometimes known as. Anyway, then you have this Eridanus, with, which I take to be the Jordan River. Okay? Eridan. Eridan. Forget about the us. That's the Latin part of it. Eridan. Eridan. There's an Egyptian word for river, which is used in the Bible a lot. Actually, of course, every time they mention the river of Egypt, they use what they called it for river, which was ear. So you have Irdan, which could mean the river of the judge. Now, it's a name. Don't forget, it's a name. So it doesn't have to be grammatically correct of how you would say it. The Jordan River, they've established that name means the descending. You know, all rivers descend. I don't see how, you know, that, I don't see how that fits for the, for the uh, meaning of the name Jordan. I mean, that's a, that's a special river in the sense that it was the border between the, the land of promise and the land of milk and honey and um, the wilderness, all right? And he had to cross over that river to get to the promised land, and they had this miracle of the water stopping when they came over. And it was like the second baptism. 
the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's significance in it. I mean, that's just to say it's descending like all rivers do, and there's no meaning in that. I don't see a meaning in that. But the, the river of the judge, it's almost like the fear of the judge. Because year is, well, in Hebrew, year would be the fear, fear of the judge. I think that's even better. They both fit. I mean, river of the judge or, or fear of the judge. But fear of the judge fits even better in this group. Because there are two reasons why we serve the Lord. And one is because we fear the judge. And the other is because there's a great reward, like what's, been, what's growing in our garden. All of those good things, fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the patience, all of those things. We are happy to serve. Why, it's a labor of love in our serving. The name Taurus comes from the Chaldean word for bull. Hebrew, it's sure. That root for sure is used for oxen and it's used for uh, prince, princess, it, it ha depending on how you pronounce it. But, then, but they have the same Hebrew letters, which is significant because, you know, um, getting to the next sign, which has to do with uh, the two names, one for a prince and one for a servant, the Gemini group, which is in the same season because we just opened the season of serving okay taurus we we just finished salvation we've grown up enough we're seasoned enough to start working we're say we're not newborn babes anymore we're eating meat and we're grown and we're doing things we're still children obeying our father but we're a little bit older and we're working we're doing some things we're saved by grace not our works but we obey him and he does have a, a job to do in saving souls and nurturing souls and correcting souls. Another part of it, which has to do with that fear of the judge part. You know, his work on earth is not only to nurture us and encourage us and promise us and help us and enliven us, give us life, heal us, give us joy. It's also to make sure that we stay on that narrow road. That's where the fear of the judge comes in. Okay, so which tribe is associated with Taurus? The oxen group, the serving group, the laboring group. So the tribe will be Issachar. He shall bring a reward. Now he got his name actually before he was born. His older brother, Reuben working, laboring, brought home mandrakes, a reward for his mother, who, Leah, who then traded that reward to Rachel, who then permitted Leah to sleep with their husband, Jacob. And from that trade, Issachar was conceived. In 1449, 14, Issachar is a strong S, couching down between two burdens. And he saw that the rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant. And he bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute. Okay, so the first one, he's a strong ass couching down between two burdens. So there's, there's two burdens. In the sign of Taurus, there are these two star clusters called the Pleiades and the Hyades. The one that's mentioned in Scripture is the Pleiades. Hyades is not mentioned in the Scripture. Nothing that you can really say, that's what Hyades was called in the days of Jacob, or in the days of Noah, or in the days of Enoch. There's nothing that I could really put my finger on. Now, there, the thing about it is that there are two burdens... And you have these two star clusters in the, the Taurus group, okay? The Hyades and the Pleiades. Now, the Pleiades has a Hebrew name. It's called Kima, all right? And it's used in the scriptures. It's used in verses. It's in there. It's in the Bible. Can you bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades? That's a question God is asking Job. This, 
But anyway, the Pleiades has this sweet influences. So it's almost like they're fragrances. Okay? And also, the Pleiades are seven bright stars. When you hear seven stars, I mean, to me, it's the seven stars of, in the book of Revelation that represent the seven churches. Now, what are their sweet influences? And also, the Pleiades are seven bright stars. When you hear seven stars, I mean, to me, it's the seven stars of, in the book of Revelation that represent the seven churches. Now, what are their sweet influences? Those are those good things when, when Jesus comes and, and addresses each church. He talks about good things, and he talks about bad things. Things that are good and are to be nurtured and encouraged. And he talks about things that need to be corrected. There it is again. Now you could say you could say that the, in that case that means that the Hyades represents um, things that need to be corrected, the more costly bunch, in a sense, the heavier things, because the things that the things that need to be corrected are the hardest, that have the greatest cost, and there and you know the word kima or a cluster, as in the cluster of the stars, but it has a a similar word, kumas. That one is used a few times and it's used for the word tablets as in gold tablets. There's two reasons why we serve the Lord. One again is the, the love, the joy, the fruits of the Spirit, those those good things. And the other one is the things that are costly, the things that have to be corrected. So, And then the third thing that uh, Magi brought what did they bring? Now the Magi were these these men that from Persia uh, were basically apprentices of Daniel, you might say, when Daniel lived in Persia. That's my belief. That's what I think, that Daniel uh, shared his knowledge of the Book of Enoch with the Persians as well as he also probably did with the Babylonians. And so they have knowledge about this king of the Jews to, that, that, was, that was promised because they have knowledge of the, the, the 48 ancient zodiac signs. So why are they bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the king of the Jews, to the Messiah, the promised Messiah that the whole, the whole zodiac group represent? I think they're getting it from the heaps that are in Taurus, the two clusters, the Hyades and the Pleiades which were fragrances and gold, kima and kumas. They think that kima came from kumas, that the ent entomology of kima came from kumas, which was gold. Okay, now getting back to God's question to Job, can you bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades, relating that to sweet fragrances such as perfume, you can put that in a jar. Frankincense and myrrh, they put that in their saddlebags. But can you put praises of God that comes from a joyous heart? Can you put certain quietness and confidence that you have, despite what's going on? That peace? Can you put the peace in your heart? Is there any way to go in there and get it out and put it someplace? Can you catch that happiness that you have when you're getting persecuted for the kingdom of God's sake? To summarize... We as Christians are like Jesus, who was as like a beast of burden, with these two burdens on his back. I mean, one, he came to nurture us, to say, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor. He came to encourage faith, and he also came to, uh, to discourage evil, unless your righteousness be... Greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Build upon the rock, learn of me, and everything he said was, was part of his, his burden of letting us know that there is a severe judgment. And he also wanted to nurture the good faithfulness that we do have. Okay, now let's go over to the next question that God asked Job. 
can you loose the bands of Orion? Now the best way to understand that question is to know the meaning of the name Orion, which again is very difficult to understand, but um, the Hebrew word there, Kassil, is, is, is a name, but it has a very close word that's used in the Bible for confidence and for folly. Almost as if the way you said it in context of how you're speaking, that word can mean two different things. Confidence and folly or foolishness. That is easily understood in the sense that things that we do in faith and in confidence and in obedience very often look like foolishness to somebody that really doesn't understand the faith part. For example, Noah, you know, it's taken him a hundred years to build a big giant boat in the middle of inland where there is no way to get that boat into any kind of water anyway. Um, the king orders an edict and says that nobody's allowed to pray, otherwise you're going to die. And after Daniel hears it, he goes out and he prays. Um, the disciples, after knowing who Jesus was, they leave their fishing nets on the seashore and they follow him. Anyway, there's, there's lots of examples like that. Now, getting back to the question, can you loose the bands of Orion? So now Orion is, this, is, this, is representing a confidence that's, well, that's not well understood on the outside, but well understood on the inside in the circles of faith. As to me, it's like the oxen and the oxen driver, Orion being the oxen driver, and he has these, and he's tied to the oxen, and there's this band, there's this rope, there's this bondage between the, the driver and the oxen. And he's asking the question, are you able to break that bond? And Paul basically answers the question in um, Romans 8. I think this is the best way to answer this question. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? And then 38, he says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's what's so hard about it. Now, Issachar, in the wilderness, when they were about the tabernacle, he lines up on the east side, along with Judah and Zebulun. Now, those three stones are on the same row on the breastplate. And you have agate, and that would be Zebulun's. Amethyst, and that would be Judah's, and so this Ligur, uh, the Hebrew name is Lashem. It's a mystery as to exactly what it is. Uh, since the Septuagint called it a Ligur, it's what a Ligur is uh, very hard to understand. So the jacinth in Revelation's foundation stones, by order of elimination, that belongs to, to Issachar. So we translate over to the breastplate, which is commonly understood to be a jacinth out of the natural zircon gemstone family. Um, and the zircon has different colors. It could be light blue, it could be dark blue, it could, and it could be red, orange, and yellow. Now this last sequence, this red, orange, yellow, we can look at the breastplates look like fire and jason and brimstone. The color sort of like fits in there of this red, orange, and yellow. And also the ass that Jacob refers to Issachar as being supposedly gets its name from a root word that connotates being red, as in being troubled red. Okay, the, the horse is a beast of burden as well. Carries people, it pulls wagons, carries burdens. Um, so that helps us to know which apostle is associated with Issachar, and that would be Philip, whose name means a lover of horses. That also makes it very easy to understand which 
of the twelve gates is associated with Issachar, and that would be the horse gate. Okay, I'd like to end with uh, Job 39.9 through 12. Will the unicorn, now that unicorn is like a wild ox, be willing to serve thee, there's the word servant, or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with, with his band in the furrow? There is an oxen driver mentioned there as the one that needs to bind the unicorn, okay? As in, can you loose the band of Orion? With his band in the furrow, so there's the origa sign. Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Will thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? He's like, he's got Issachar's name. He, will he bring his reward? Will he bring your seed into, and gather it and put it in the barn? Will you trust him to do that?